creative words, the creative power of words, what they change and what they transform, and who gets the privilege of speaking them. Okay? All right. So, words change the natural world, the world of the scene. Everything you see is of the natural world. Everything you see. All right? Whatsoever you see, we're created by words. You say, wait a minute, there's manufacturing plants. Well, yeah, but the manufacturing plant's only there because there was a word, the word of creation. He didn't, God didn't just work with his hands to create this earth and planet and it's still going on. He, didn't, he did it with words. When he spoke them, the end result of that, he went and sat down. He's still seated, by the way. He doesn't have to get up when you have a crisis. He has left things in place. So let's just look at what words hold for us today. I will tell you this, that the word of God holds the universe you see together. There's an Old Testament scripture. I didn't look it up. I didn't think about it until right now. He says he hangs the world on nothing. You know you're sitting here on nothing. That's what he put the world on, nothing. And he says it. Well, scientists says there's all kinds of reason. There's an axis, and there's all kinds of these things that happen. True, but who put that in place? See? Goes back to the Word. We're going to look at this a little more. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, saying this. And I'm going to hold tight to the Scriptures today. You're going to see quite a few of them. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see what the Word of God says regarding these things. Okay, God who at sundry times, well, there are some words, various times, and in divers' manners, or various methods, spake, uttered words, talked, in time past, or formerly, in old times, unto the fathers by the prophets. The old covenant wasn't inaccurate. You guys, we do realize, don't we, there was an old covenant and there's a new covenant. There's a new covenant based upon better promises of which Jesus Christ become the sacrifice to institute that covenant. Okay? The old covenant wasn't inaccurate. It was incomplete. We have a better revelation. Second verse, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. His son. Whom? Whom he has appointed heir of all things. Oh, by the way, you're going to see a lot of all today. All, always, ever. All means the same thing. All, any, every, whole, the whole works. By the way, the Greek definition for all, I heard it on a recording last week. You know what the Hebrew definition for all is? All. <laughs> all. There you are. All. So here he is. He made him, Jesus, heir of all things, by whom also he made, created, ordained the world. Wow. Or did that say worlds? Worlds. You say, wait a minute. There's other worlds out there. He created them. You say, what for? I don't know. He hasn't told me. All I know is he's got S on there for a reason. Worlds. Any scientist will tell you, it just keeps going out there, out there, and out there further. I'll not try to get into that today. In Colossians 1, 16 and 17, it says this. For by him were what? All. Okay? All. All things created that are in heaven, that are in earth. Who created all things? Jesus created all things that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. Ooh. He is before all things, 
And by him all things consist, or are set together, favorably introduced and exhibited. It's set right out there before you. He did it. Great. John 1, 3. All things. Now, have you, are you, is he removing any doubt that this came through him? All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. <laughs> you know, it, it is just interesting. These things are there because of spoken words. Revelations 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. They are and were created. Am I created? Yes, I'm created. What am I created for? What does it tell you? His pleasure. Sometimes I think we just need to sit down and begin to get, comprehend the love of God. We are there because of the love of God. He created us for his pleasure. Old timer. Come up to me one day and years ago and he said, Lynn, you know what it's like to sit in a chair or you think you're sitting in a chair and you begin to think on him and all of a sudden you know that you have been picked up, placed in his arms, and he's hugging you. Imagine that. Well, it may not have been a case of where he picked you up, but you definitely know he surrounds you and is in you. Maybe a different set, different set of circumstances, but to George, he was being held in the arms of love, just as you hold the child. No different. Yet maybe deeper. Maybe same principle. For thy pleasure, all things for thy pleasure, they are and were created. The next verse we're going to look at is Romans eight seventeen. And this really hang on. Let me read this. Jesus is the heir of all that God has and is. Jesus is the heir. We wouldn't debate that for a minute, would we? You can shake your head or we remain motionless. And we are joint heirs with him. Now let's take a look at this. Are you his child? If you're his child, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Whoa. I'll finish this verse. How many has read to the end of this verse? And you have a question about these next few words. Do you? I don't want to get into this if you don't have a question. But if you, I started already, didn't I? My wife says, stop digging. If ye then, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Suffer. What kind of suffering do you expect us to endure? Persecution. If you serve him, you're going to be persecuted, flat out persecuted. But then I look at this, and if he has suffered something for me, then he's taken my place. He is my substitute. Is that not right? He bore it for me. So that's not the suffering he's talking about, just for the record. So that must be a product caused by something else. Or someone else but I have the right of standing with him as an heir a joint heir of of God with Jesus Christ there I can boldly proclaim certain things or very boldly say certain things I have promises that are recorded that are mine yours amen all right let's go Back to Hebrews 1, 3. And you say, well, we was there once, but we're going back. So down here somewhere, who being 
Oh, who being the brightness, thank you, Steph, or Bill, or who being the brightness of his glory. Now, I'm adding things as you go along, you can tell, all right? Glory. Well, I'll let you off the hook, unless you want to answer. Glory. Jesus had glory. Mm -hmm. His Father gave him glory. What do you think you have? Jesus prays. Jesus prays. I'll tell you where to go look it up. It's in John 17. It's when Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, the glory that you've given me, I have given them. He dropped that off of you. We just need to recognize some of these things that he has done on our behalf. If, if we begin to recognize the things he's done on our behalf, then we begin to live differently. Or we begin to see that we inherited blessings that we may not have manifest in our life at the moment. But we have a right for those. Okay, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, he says, in, he says in Corinthians that we are changed into his image from glory to glory. He's changing me. That's what he says. And upholding all things, how many things? All things, by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Well, great. Mm. So, then as an heir, can I speak God's word? And I can speak, then does the power remain in those words? Absolutely. So, when he got done, he's seated and it is finished. That's what happened. Then, we get to proceed. Hidden mysteries are revealed. Then spoken, taught, brings salvation and wholeness, makes disciples and ministers liberty and freedom. Mysteries. Colossians 1, 20, 26 through 28. The mystery which has been from ages, hid from ages and from generations, but what's that word now? What is that word? Is what? Now. 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 Today. Now. Today. Was that when this was written, it is now also today, is made manifest or revealed to his saints. You say, I, I, don't, I don't understand. Well, hello. The Spirit of God, he says in the 16th chapter of John, he also says in 1 John, is there to guide us, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us into all truth. True? He reveals mysteries. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Verse 28 says about four things that we want to emphasize this morning, and it'll take us a bit of a, a little bit of time to get there. The first two are quick, then there's some other scriptures that support it, and then we go to three and four, just to tell you what's happening. Whom we preach, one, warning, teaching, all wisdom, he may present you perfect or complete. That's where we're going. So whom we preach, warning every man, carries the idea of caution, uh, makes aware of potential danger, things to deal with, uh, and methods to and means of motivating us to action. Two, teaching every man, instructing, training, imparting knowledge, spiritual truth. It's the responsibility of every believer to carry out the great commission of Christ. Oh boy. Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things. How many things? All things. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. That's another word for all. All. Even unto the end of the world. Now let me break this down a little. To observe. That's all things. 
to guard from loss or injury properly by keeping an eye upon, which implies a fortress or full military lines of, of apparatus, hold fast, keep, preserve, and watch. What? His teaching and the teaching you share. I am with you always. Here you go. Here is, I'm going to finally give you Strong's definition for all. All, any, every, the whole, all manner of, all means of, always, anyone, any day, every day, everyone, every way. Got it? All is all. Simple as that. Teaching is also necessary to ensure freedom from the forces of darkness. Wow. John 8, 29 through 32. Jesus said, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. I do always those things that please him. Okay. Likewise, the Father is always with him. Sometimes you feel like you're out there all alone. You can nod. <laughs> you know. But he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Okay? You're not out there alone. Oh, boy. See? I, he would, can I, I'll say this. He would be unjust. Ready? He would be unjust to send us on supernatural missions with only the natural to deal with it. So he sends us with supernatural enablements to deal with supernatural things. Well, along with the fact he never leaves us nor forsakes us. The Father never left the Son. The Father never leaves us because we put we put faith in Jesus and recognize that God's righteousness has been imparted to us or imputed to us. Put it on your account. Put it on your account. Ruth used to work in a bank. And she put money to people's account when they had it. You know, Jesus has stored up a lot of riches that he's willing to bless us with. And he wants to impute it to us or put it on our account. One of those things really stands out is righteousness. Or right, simply put, it's right standing with God. But beyond that, it is various other things. Innocence. Wow. It is the equity of character and actions. And maybe we'll look at that a little more before we're done here this morning. But if he sends us, he equips us. Look at John 17, 18. Again, we're back in the 17th chapter of John. As thou hast sent me, this is Jesus talking to the Father. As thou hast sent me, as thou hast sent me, Jesus said, even so, just as have I also sent them into the world. He didn't leave you alone. He don't take you out there and drop you off. Mm -mm. He's equipped you to do this. Not because I say it, but because the Word of God says it. Oh. Back to, on to verse 30. And he spake these words. Many, uh, can we back up maybe to the last set of verses before this one? Thank you. <laughs> Bill said this morning, Steph. He's getting pretty good at this. <laughs> and so is Chris. It, sometimes I don't leave them clear set of directions. Road signs are kind of slim. Okay. Uh, As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, If you continue or stay in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So here we go. Is there a difference between a believer and a disciple? If there is, it's based on their action or, or ministry. Because it takes a believer to start this course. What does he say here? Those Jews which believe on him, 
If you continue or stay in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Oh, continuing in his word will have a benefit. Wow, what can it be? Hmm, I've been forgiven. Boy, I've, I've got a home in heaven, but I've got a life to live here on earth. I want to live it in the, in the victory that he has provided for me. Staying in God's word, I'm probably going to make a statement here, and you might have to swallow a little deep. Can you do that? All right, here we go. Staying in God's word should be a lifestyle. Mm. What are you trying to say? Hebrews also talks about the just living by faith. They just don't spend weekends there. It's a lifestyle. Lifestyle. You say, Warren was asking me some questions, but I guess in all these years we never sat down and give a little history lesson of ourselves. But he says, I don't know how you do this. I don't know how you do it and, and have done it and work. I said, well, in the days gone by when I was a store manager for Kroger, I seen the days I would take my lunch hour and study for the sermon that we were going to deliver that night. I said, is that all the time it takes you? Oh, no, not today. <laughs> okay? No, no, not today. I read a survey in the Grand Rapids Press one time, and they asked some pastors, how long did it take you to prepare for Sunday? They said three to five hours. I said, well, Wow. Wow, how do they do that? You know, I asked Dale. He says, I said, Dale, how, many, how much time does it take? He's a missionary in the Ukraine. How much time does it take, Dale? He says, minimum 10 hours. <laughs> I tell you, it takes me sometimes longer than that. But that's just, that's me. That's just how it works. Sometimes they're, they just roll out, and you go deliver it. Sometimes you don't even have it. You just go deliver it anyhow, you know, because you don't know what you're going to say. When I mentioned this before. When we used to be traveling, I remember in a little church out in the country, south and east of here, I went out and walked through the brush because I didn't have a sermon for night. And the service is going to be in a little while, probably less than an hour now. And uh, I come back in, and I said to the people that's traveling with us, I says, um, I got about five minutes worth. Bruce says, it'll, it'll be an hour. But that's all I had was, an, was five minutes. But when he sticks it in there, you got to let it go. So some of them doesn't take much time at all. So... It says then, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free is to liberate, to exempt. And I want to be free. Then we, we're back down here. Well, actually, we're in Colossians 1.28. Can we find that one? Oh, we got it. Thank you. <laughs> Whom we preach, we warned every man, we're teaching every man, that's all men, all men, in all wisdom. Now, I have a couple of educators here. They, I, would I embarrass you if I pointed? You know, everybody knows Warren's an educator. They might not know that you're an educator. Mm. Yeah. You guys ever feel like you don't have wisdom? <laughs> yeah, he's teaching in the college and, and there, or university, and there you are. I remember, I remember one time not having wisdom. Tony probably don't know a thing about this, but one of her bunk beds back in uh, in St. Joe, Michigan, got worked over one day because I needed wisdom. I needed. Why are you laughing? <laughs> so I I knelt beside that bunk bed and I asked him for wisdom, because he gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Let him ask in faith, not doubting, not wavering. 
and he'll give him wisdom. Got it? Got it. I understand that. I understand that. But then one day, years later, I come across 1 Corinthians 1.30. Look at this one. It, look at this. But of him, that him is God, are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. You receive Jesus, you receive wisdom. It's just that simple. It's in there. You got to draw from it. Wisdom. That's supernatural wisdom. That's his wisdom. Oh, hello. Wisdom that he never leaves us. Therefore, wisdom never leaves us. His words ne never leave us. His creative words never leave us. That we may present ever man. Well, if we was back to the where we just left we would find that we present every man perfect or complete in him. Wow. We've already heard that creative words frame the world. Is that what we found out? Hebrews 11.3 says this. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, formed, completed thoroughly by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of we're not made of things which do appear. Wow. Wow. What are you saying? Therefore, everything we see will respond to words spoken in faith. That's how they came, through spoken words. That's how the world was. And is. Through spoken words. That's all right. All right? So they responded in the beginning by creation by words. They'll respond today by words. Somebody asked me the other day, well, maybe it was Bill. He said, Do you ever seen rain stop? I said, I've seen a storm put off once. He said, What do you mean? My wife, my wife had clothes on the line, and I learned a lesson. <laughs> and it looked like rain. So I said, let those clothes dry before the rain gets here. All of a sudden, after a while, it started to sprinkle. I thought, what's it doing? Right. The clothes were dry. I wasn't on a stick. <laughs> you see, he did what we said. You say, can you do that? The guy in Africa, what's his name? The Holland, the Dutch person from Africa, uh, Reinhard Bonnke, had a humongous tent. That's a word, by the way. may not be spoken right, but it's got the principle of a great big tent. He had big six-wheel trucks that hauled all this stuff. And down the valley where this tent was standing came this raging storm. What did he do? He went out in front of the tent, in front of the storm, and told that storm it couldn't come here. What happened? The storm came down the valley, split, and went around his tent and all his equipment. Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves. Yeah. You say, Lynn, you're beside yourself. You're just L.L. L. Winans, but I'm, I'm L.L. L. Winans, born again, child of God, filled with the Spirit, and his words dwell in here. All this stuff that is created responded in the beginning to creative words. Mm. Everything you see is accustomed to respond to words. Words created them. Words conceived them. Now today, words mixed with faith is the substance of things not seen and become the evidence of things seen. Whoa. Well, 2 Corinthians 4.18. Oh, thank you. <laughs> While we look not at the things which are seen, see, our tendency is to look at what we see, what we can feel, what we can do this and do that. You ever notice? I hurt. My billfold's speaking to me. There's nothing in it. Checkbook, puny. Hey, I need a refresher. 
Can you speak to that stuff? He says, I have riches. How's it going to get here? It's going to come on the wings of faith, words. But watch your words. Watch what you say. We just laugh and chuckle at some of, at some of the things that people say. You know, we laugh, chuckle. I tell you, we need to get serious about what we say and how we say it. Really serious. Okay? And, all right. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, look beyond the seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. Mark 13, 31 Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my what? My words shall not pass away. They're eternal words. They're creative words. There's authority and power resides in the unseen. The unseen spoken words are creative words. You see, are you sure you're all right, Lynn? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. We all recognize, don't we, that words are weapons? Huh. Words are weapons. We all also realize that one, creative weapon, weapons work for good. Destructive weapons work for evil. True? Hang on. Isaiah 54, 17. Here you are. No weapon. Here it starts off in this verse talking about weapons. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Got it? Statement promise, if you will, every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. You say, what do you mean? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit. Let me finish this verse. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Hmm. What are you saying, Lynn? I'm saying no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every, all tongues that shall rise against you in judgment, adversarial decree, thou shalt condemn to do, to be, to declare it wrong. Because those words, wrong words, by implication, they will disturb, violate, break, interrupt, disturb, and we have to violate and break those negative words before they violate or break us. Wow. Hang on. Hang on. Words that infringe, trespass, overstep, defy my peace, my rights, those things obtained by Jesus, death and suffering. If somebody's words come against any of those, what does it tell me to do? Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. I'm going to, at the risk for some of you, I'm going to share this with you. Several years ago, my wife was in the hospital. She had a back operation. Come out of it. We sat there. I sat on the window ledge. A nurse come in, doctor, as a matter of fact, and ask her how she was doing, and she, she hurt. The doctor said, on a scale of zero to 10, where are you? Now, this woman, she said, they, they thought strange things about her for years. That's not quite how I wanted that to come out. <laughs> one, one day, they said she had this horrible disease, and the only way they could make sure that she had it was to deaden her leg in a circle and go in live in her thigh. Okay, all it stopped was the pain from radiating sideways. Got it? So they cut her, reached down in there and took out a muscle and sent in to find out that she didn't have that at all. I've seen this lady take pain Pain at pain, yes, pain. 
And this day, when the doctor asked her zero to 10, she said 20. And I thought, whoa, whoop do you do? What is going on here? I sat back in that windowsill and asked the Lord, I said, I didn't have wisdom, okay? What is this? What causes this? He gave me a person, gave me a name, and said, spoken words. What'd you do? I come against those words that were spoken. Now, the individual wasn't there, so I couldn't get to that one, but I spoke against these words that were uttered. I probably could have asked her right then, but I probably waited, I don't know, three or four minutes, whatever it was. I said, Ruth, how's it now? I forget if she said five or seven. Hello? What else did you do? When I got back to the office, I put my fingers in the phone and called that person. You say, you didn't. I said, I did. I said, what have you been saying about us and Ruth? Well, I don't know. I got to check it out. Hello. I said, I want to meet you. Oh, no, we don't want to meet. Of course we didn't want to meet. There's something there that was foreign to a, a born-again child of God shouldn't have been dickering in those areas. They had a foot in both camps. Because Jesus came that I might have life, and Ruth might have life and have it more abundantly. The, the Satan came, the enemy came, to steal, kill, and destroy. He was stealing her well-being because he had jumped on words that somebody had muttered or did it on purpose. I don't know. They never did meet with me. But I at least did my best to cause them to consider. Wow. You say, for real? For real. For real. Oh, my goodness. Break those words. And do it now. This is the heritage, he says, or the inheritance, the possession of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness, brightness, and justice is of me, saith the Lord. This verse speaks of weapons and then speaks of words. Words are weapons for destruction or words for good. There you are. Proverbs 18, 21. Are you all on a diet? No. Okay. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Right? And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What diet are you on? Hmm? Again, we say we have to deal with the negative words that come against us, declare them wrong, break them. Words of an enemy works evil to us by using destructive words. But hang on, there's something a, a little more real to each one of us. Our vain, empty words sometimes have within them the germ of destruction. You say, I don't intend it that way. I, you may not. Our words should be creative words supporting our wellness and well-being. Now, hang on here. I'm going to talk I'm going to give you an illustration out of the book of Acts. This is Paul and Barnabas. They're at Antioch in the uh, 13th chapter of Acts, 6 through 12 verses. It's the doctrine uh, that amazes and astonishes. A doctrine. You re we realize that doctrines has amazed and astonished the Christian world since Jesus was ministering. That's what he says. They were astonished, amazed at his doctrine. You say, well, doctrine is words. Ah, uh -uh, hang on. Words are also action because it's things like casting out demons. They were amazed at his doctrine. It was his action they were amazed at. Here we go. This is now Paul and Barnabas at Antioch, verse 6. And when he had gone through the aisle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Barhesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, 
a prudent man or a man putting things together. See, because he called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the words of God. But Elmas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now, Elmas means a wizard, or in this case, witchcraft runs along with it. They are incompatible. I, I was thinking about this. I was teaching a Sunday school class years ago. Mary may have been in it, but it's not her I'm going to talk about. All right, and a big conference, conference table full of people, people in a, another row of chairs, and uh, mentioned something of, of demonic evil, and a lady sitting right here, right around the corner from me, said, I believe that there's not only dark things that are bad for you, I believe some of those things of the demonic are, are light. They not. They don't hurt you. You can mess with that. And I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have an answer for her. Finally, I just looked at her and said this. I said, how depressed are you? Stunned. For she was depressed. I don't know if she ever went back to it or not. But you can't mess in that stuff without coming away with dirt on you, so to speak. Spiritual dirt. Just does not happen. Then Paul, <laughs> you say, would you do this, Lynn? I don't know. I, the more I read it, I might. Oh, where, where are we? Then Saul who also is called Paul, down to the bottom, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Next. And said, O oh, full and covered over. That's exactly what that word full is. It's covered over. O oh, full and covered over of all subtlety, deceit, all mischief, malignity, thou child of the devil, thou enemy, adversary of all righteousness. Now here I was going to insert something positive. We, who are believers, has God's righteousness. I've confessed this, and I, I think maybe I'll stop soon. I, I will tell you this. I had difficulty with this word righteousness and Strong's definition of the word righteous. Strong says it's equity of character and acts. And my, for years I looked at that equity. Equity. Who? Who? Who's equity? Who? 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 is measuring this. And how is he measuring it in me? How is he measuring that? Well, whose righteousness is it? It's God's righteousness. See? It's God's righteousness placed in me. When Jesus took my sin, he gave me God's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21. So, you see where I'm going with that? Equity of character and acts. He expects us to live victorious, overcoming lives. Mm. This is established by God's righteousness. And the root of that is innocence and holy. Will you not cease to pervert or misinterpret the right ways of God? Can you just, has anybody heard, Lynn? I, do, equity of character and acts, are you sure? That seems pretty far out there. It's God's righteousness. I'm to act in it. I'm clothed with it. I'm created in it. Oh, my. Oh. And now, Paul says, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, a darkness, and went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. <laughs> you say, you do that? You do that? You do that? Yeah, I think so. Given the right set of circumstances, I do that. Okay, then the deputy, when he saw what was done, 
believe, being astonished or amazed at the doctrine, instruction, and the action of the Lord. Paul's words created the condition, and the Lord's blessing. I'm just going to give you a, a set of verses here. Your promotion, your family. You're in his family. Matthew 12, 46 through 50. Basically, I'm going to read this to you. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them, What did he say? He said to those that told him, Ask him two questions. Who is my mother and who is my brother? And stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, sister, and mother. I couldn't help it. Look, look, women are included as the disciples. Pretty cool, huh? Or in the family. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and mother. Oh, boy. Luke, in the same set of circumstances, in 821, says this. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are they which hear the word of God and do it. Whoa. That unchanging word, that creative word. They hear the word of God and do it. How are they going to do it? They're going to do it because he's authorized and approved it to do it. It is the authority he downloaded. All right. One verse left. I'm going to give you a background. Unless we unless we got it up there. I'm going to give you a little background. Matthew records, and I'll give you the chapter 12. They brought to him a person that was blind, dumb, which in this case would be deaf and speechless. And Matthew says he healed him. Or, so that... Then goes on to mention that there was demonic... See, and the people were amazed. The church went nuts. The Pharisees come unhinged, so to speak. They said, he cast out devils by the prince of devils. And Jesus' immediate response, he wasn't going to allow that to stand. In Luke eleven twenty, here's what he says. But if I, with the finger of God, huh? but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Hmm? It concludes in the 30th verse, which we won't have on the screen unless Steph gets it right up there. Wow. You, if you're not with me, you're against me. He puts it right down where we live. The creative power of words. The creative power of words. They work for Jesus. They work for Paul. They work for you and I. Father,
The word says we're to live and move and have our being in you. We want to live in you, have our being in you. We want the clouds that blinds the mind or clouds the mind from the truth of the word of God to go away. So the truth, the word, the creative words can get inside these lives. Glenn, health, where his body has been weak. Heart, flow of blood. You remove the blockage. No, blockage be removed in Jesus' name. Creative words. Pain in Linda's neck be removed. No, pain in Linda's neck go away. Go away in Jesus' name. And may the creative happening that's necessary within the neck and within the heart of the blood vessels that flow into the heart, may, may they be recreated. Let the recreation take place in Jesus' name. Take place. Take place. Your words create. We're joint heirs with Christ, who is the Son of God. Father, you place within us the Godhead. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you for doing a divine work. Thank you that we serve the one that brings good things. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow or turning. That's what you give. We receive what you give in these people's lives, in all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well.